Hello all Aaron Maytard this side and welcome to today's episode. Today we're going to be talking about the book Awaken the Giant Within by Tony Robbins. Now, Tony Robbins is obviously one of the most well-respected life coaches in the entire world. He's helped millions of people transform their lives through his books, his videos, seminars and etc., including the lives of some really high-caliber professionals, people in politics, celebrities and etc. that have trusted Tony with helping them perform at their absolute best. And today with Awaken the Giant Within, we're going to talk about how to create change in an instant and then also how to sustain long-term change so that you can create a compelling future. So without further ado, I'll get into the mind map of this video. And in the introduction, I just wanted to talk a little bit about this book in particular. I've talked about how important Tony Robbins is to the entire pop psychology movement, but really with this book, any book written after this, since this book is simply a footnote, because Tony really pioneered the field with this great work and it really does go very in depth. If you've read other pop psychology books, other books on change in other books on um, making lasting change with your life, you'll really realize how in depth this book is. And it's quite a long book actually, but this book really does go through everything, whereas other books might focus on specific parts of the change system. Tony has really brought it in and put it all together and showed us kind of how the puzzle fits together with this book. And with that being said, I wanted to jump into a couple of my favorite quotes from the book. Ah, uh, just to give you a quick little overview of what's going to be talked about in this mind map. The first quote is that most people fail in life simply because the major and minor things and isn't this the truth um, so often we're focusing on things that have little or no impact on our life when if we just spent the same amount of effort on something that had a lot of leverage or a lot of leverage on us, we'd be able to make either short term change in an instance or we'd be able to keep ourselves to some of the longer lasting changes that will make a meaningful difference in our life. The next quote is you see in life, lots of people know what to do but few people actually can actually do what they know and knowing is not enough and you must take action. And I think these two quotes really go together well because that really is one of the things that people are focusing on is knowing what to do. So often we're focusing on creating these elaborate plans with the logical side of our brain rather than going out and taking action. And as my coach and mentor says, action creates clarity. So simply knowing what to do is not even one half of the equation because really you don't know what to do until you've taken the action to create clarity around that which you would like to achieve any time. The next quote is any time you sincerely want to make a change, the first thing you must do is raise your standards. When people ask me what really changed my life eight years ago, I tell them that an absolute, that the absolute, the most important thing was changing what I demand of myself. I wrote down all the things that I would no longer accept in my life, all the things I would no longer tolerate, and all the things that I aspired to become. So this is very interesting, and this is not necessarily a philosophical quote, but this really is kind of the essence of what this book is all about. This is till into just one short paragraph. We're really going to talk about raising your standards. We're going to talk about what you demand of yourself. We're going to talk about the decisions that you make based on what you demand of yourself. And then we're also going to talk about, like I said in the beginning, compete, creating a compelling future. So the last little part of my introduction here is just a quick synopsis. The book is really about the making the lasting change part. Change in an instant is important, but the making the lasting change is what I feel is the hardest part for most people. That sustained motivation, um, and that sustained correct decisions and, and actually changing your identity, changing your belief systems in order to become someone that you wish to become. So this is what really the whole entire book is all about. It's about raising your standards. It's about changing your limiting beliefs of who you think you are now. And it's about changing your strategy because once you have the goal, once you've changed your belief, once you've changed your identity and you want to accomplish something, you have to look at people who have been successful in whatever you're looking to change previously to you to be able to change your strategy. 
because your strategy might not necessarily be the quickest, most direct route to whatever you're trying to accomplish. And what you'll notice is that most people are doing this in the exact opposite direction. Most people are spending all their time changing their strategy rather than raising their standards and changing their limiting beliefs and taking action, which are the most important parts. But most people are spending all of their time in changing their strategy. So the first part we're going to talk about is this change in an instant. And the first part of changing in instant is really decisions and everything that happens in your life, both what you're thrilled with and what you're challenged by began with a decision. It's in your moments of decision that your destiny is shaped. This is absolutely the truth, as I was talking about before, between action and inaction. Most people are deciding on a daily basis to be in a state of inaction, of not taking action towards their, towards their destiny, towards their goals. And if you simply chose to take small actions, it doesn't have to be anything massive. Even if you decide to make a small action towards your destiny, that is a decision that will move you forward rather than keep you in the same place. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we expand the mind. Map it. So if you don't set a baseline standard for what you accept in your life, you'll find it easy to slip into behaviors and attitudes or our quality of life that's far below what you deserve. As we talked about in the beginning here, if you don't have the baseline standard of taking action before developing a great plan, you are going to be consistently brought down by needing to overthink a plan before you go and actually take action on it, which as we talked about before, is going to leave you in a place of constantly thinking and not getting anything accomplished. So the truth of the matter is that there's nothing that you can accomplish and you have to really believe this. And I really believe this, and I believe this for all of you out there as well. If you clearly decide what it is that you're absolutely committed to achieving, you're willing to take massive action towards that goal. You'll notice what's working or you notice what's working and what's not working. So that's that action creates clarity part right there. You continue to change your approach until you achieve what you want. Using whatever life gives you along the way. And again, this is really the exact opposite way of most people are doing. Most people are starting with number 4, continually changing their approach without actually taking action to create clarity. So very, very important that you follow it step by step and not in the opposite direction as most people are. So another question, we talked about the decisions, ah, 10 years from today, us you will surely sir survivors surely arrive. The question is where, where will you arrive after 10 years so you can ask yourself, this is based on your decisions. How am I going to live the next 10 years of my life? This is the based on the decisions that you're going to make. How am I going to live today in order to create the tomorrow that I'm committed to? What am I going to stand for from now on? What's important to me right now and what will be important to me in the long term? What actions can I take and that will shape my ultimate destiny? And these are all decisions that you need to think about in order to get to be where you would want to be in the next 10 years. So three decisions that control your destiny. You have three decisions. What to focus on, what things mean to you and what to create, what to do to create the results that you desire. Again, very important that you follow it in this order. You need to cultivate the decision of focusing only on things that are going to reinforce what you believe to be important to you. And you also want to turn the things that are negative, that are taking your energy, that are taking your attention, that you have to focus on. You want to make sure that you're turning those around and figuring out how to make those a positive thing to you by changing the meaning that those things have to you. And then you also need to decide what you're going to do to create the results that you desire. And one big part of that is that constant improvement. The continually change your approach until you achieve what you want. And that needs to be a decision that you constantly make. And as you can see, decisions never really end. The decision isn't a one-time thing. A decision to start taking action is a one-time decision, but then there's a million decisions that happen after that decision. 
So the next thing we're gonna talk about when it comes to making change in an instant is pain and pleasure. So all decisions in our life are dictated by a desire to escape pain and instead enjoy pleasure. Very interesting because a lot of the times we think that we make these decisions and I think it is true in certain cases we can kind of willpower our way into making certain decisions that we think will be better for us. But really it's interesting because all of those decisions are really dictated by a desire to escape pain and instead enjoy pleasure. And really if you're going to get yourself to make decisions, it's kind of a process of getting yourself to believe that the decision that you're making is going to be more pleasurable than it is to be, um, potentially painful to you rather than actually making a decision. It's kind of controlling the way that you believe the outcome is going to happen with pain and pleasure. So he says, after all, what is procrastination it's when you know you should do something but you still don't. And why not the answer is simple. At some level, you believe that taking action in this moment would be more painful than just putting it off and very interesting that you need to talk about that's what you believe. Because right after this we're going to talk about belief systems, but once you see that you're believing the reason you're not making a certain decision, even though maybe in the back of your mind, you know that this is what you should do is because you suck for some reason, you believe you've got yourself to believe that it's going to be more painful than it is pleasurable for you. For most people, the fear of loss is much greater than the desire for gain. And this is why, again, I think it's maybe easier for people to continually live in that constantly changing the plan and coming up with a better and better and better plan rather than taking action towards their goals. I know for me it's much more, um, I have much less fear when I'm thinking about doing these videos and thinking about how I'm gonna structure the videos and etc than actually going ahead and doing it. Because putting this out, I have a little bit of fear of loss of putting this video out for you guys because I'm worried that you might not like the video. But what I have to do is kind of really increase my potential desire for gain. And the book is really going to show you how to do this. But essentially the way that I do it is I think about you out there needing this information and me being the type of person that can come through and articulate it just perfectly for your ears to give you a great paradigm shift in order to make a big change in your life. And to me that is definitely the big desire for gain. And the bigger I can make that idea, the more frequently I will go after trying to accomplish this specific, putting out these videos specifically for you. So the secret to success is learning how to use pain and pleasure instead of having pain and pleasure use you. If you do that, you're in control of your life. If you don't, your life controls you. So exactly what I was talking about right in the point before. This is how I'm using pain and pleasure. I know I'm motivated between pain and pleasure and a desire for pleasure and a desire to avoid pain as much as possible. So I really focus on upplaying the pleasure and trying to downplay the pain whenever I'm trying to get myself to do something that maybe I'm potentially going to procrastinate on. So a little bit more about the secret to success here is when we link massive pain to any behavior or emotional pattern, we will avoid indulging in it at all costs. We can use this understanding to harness the force of pain and pleasure to change virtually anything in our lives. But if we fail to direct our own association to pain and pleasure, we're living no better than animals or machines continually reacting to our environment. Oh, housing, whatever comes up next to determine the direction and quality of our lives. So you can see how animals and machines can't control the way that they believe or the way that they perceive a certain situation. So they actually can't control the pain. And pleasure? They're at the mercy of the environment. Unlike human beings who we really can control. And this is really big. And Viktor Frankl's man's search for meaning who I think Tony was definitely inspired by. How can he not be inspired by Viktor Frankl but I think this is a big part of the book as well, is that we really choose the way that we see our environment. It's that gap between the stimulus and the response that we have to the environment that we can actually control our destinies within. So Tony also says is not actual pain that drives us, but our fear that something will lead to pain. And it's not the actual pleasure that drive us, but our belief, our sense of certainty, that somehow taking a certain action will lead to pleasure. We're not driven by the reality, 
but by our perception of reality, very important to realize that our perception of reality is our reality. It's not actually, there is no objective reality. There's many different realities based on how we're currently seeing our environment in our reality. So simply by linking pain to the behaviors that we want to stop at such a high level of emotional intensity that we won't even consider those behaviors any longer than simply linked pleasure to the new behavior that you desire for yourself. And this is exactly the same thing that I always talking about with doing these videos for you guys, is I'm trying to link a massive amount of pleasure of potential upside for not only me, but the people that I want to help influence to lead better lives in the bigger I can make that pleasure the easier it is for me to wake up and want to do this action in this decision and not have to use willpower in order to do it. So we're changing pain and pleasure. We're going to have a little step by step here. What you can do is write down four things that you've been putting off and under each thing, write why haven't I taken action on this so the things that you procrastinated on it in the past, what pain have I linked to taking an action on this very interesting. You need to realize this is the thing I've been procrastinating and this is why I've been procrastinating on it. So write down all the pleasures even experienced in the past, passed by indulging in this negative pattern. Why does it feel good to put these things off what short term pleasures are motivating you to ignore the long term pains now this is obviously assuming that you have been procrastinating on something that is going to be a net positive for you, uh, eventually in your life. So what will it cost you if you do the change now, if you don't change now, be honest with yourself. What will it cost you over the next month, the next year, the next decade if you don't change this pattern very interesting. Again, one of the ways that he talks about in the book to link pain and pleasure is that a lot of times we're thinking of pain and pleasure in the moment, in the here and now. Um, for example, when you're trying to do something that's very big and complex, it doesn't feel very good. It doesn't feel very, ah, uh, potentially a positive for you, potentially pleasurable for you to take 8 hours out of your day and work fervently and hard at this thing when it might take you 5 or 10 years to actually accomplish something worthwhile within that. But if you can think 5, 10, 15 years when I've spent a lot of time on this specific task and got world class at what I'm trying to get world class at, think about the pleasure that will be there in the future. And that's one of the ways that you can get yourself to potentially stop procrastinating a little bit easier. That's one way that I like to do it as well. So write down all the pleasure you'll receive by taking action on these right now. And again, same thing. You can put that out into the future, put that potential long term benefit and really write that down and really think about that rather than thinking about the short term or even better to not think about it at all. Not think about what's giving you pain and what's giving you pleasure whatsoever with this specific action that you need to take. But you aren't taking that so the next part we're going to talk about with change in an instant is belief systems. So it's not the events of our lives that shape us, but our beliefs as to what those events mean. And we talked about that a little bit with reality as well. So most of our beliefs are generalizations about our past, based on our interpretations of painful or pleasurable experiences. So when you think about your current potential procrastination, um, as we talked about in the last step, if you're currently procrastinating on something, what pain have you had in the past and is that a generalization did you get pain in the past because you failed at something, but you're looking at failure as pain well, is that failure really pain maybe it was painful for a short time, but maybe you are able to learn from. And in the end that ends up being pleasurable. So it's very important to go back and look at these generalizations that you're making about either failure or if you're looking back at certain things that didn't go right in a business venture, for example, you are thinking of them maybe as painful, but if you can turn those around and think of them as pleasurable, then you will go out and you will seek more and more and more and more failure because you realize that the more you fail, the more you move towards your goal because the more you end up learning. So with emotion, enough emotional intensity and repetition, our nervous system experiences something as real, even if it hasn't occurred yet. So that's very interesting. It's, you're constantly repeating a potential failure in your mind, right you've taken this generalization about the failure that you have had in the past, 
and then you're constantly kind of ruminating on this potential failure in the future and with that emotional intensity and that repetition, our nervous system experiences that are real, even if it hasn't occurred yet. So you feel like you've already failed because you've constantly ruminated on a potential failure that maybe you're extrapolating something that you're doing now to something that you've done in the past. Very interesting. Very interesting. So the way to change your beliefs is one, you got to get your brain to associate massive pain with the belief that you have right now. So say for example, again, you're afraid of this failure and you're not taking action towards your goals because you're afraid of a failure that you've generalized about in the past. Associate massive pain with being afraid of failure. Because if you are afraid of failure, you will constantly be wherever you are for good. So you need to constantly think and you need to really associate massive pain with being afraid of failure. And instead you want to create some doubt aren't the old beliefs of yours that you've defended a that you're embarrassed about now, write some things that you thought in the past that really aren't the truth, ah, uh, don't crept in and push them out. So you need to start doubting this newer belief that you want to get rid of write down the fact that failure is a bad thing because this one in particular, you can extrapolate into a lot of different areas, but failure is not a bad thing. Failure is good. The more you fail, the more you learn. So very, very important to change. Not only that specific bullying, but to really look inside yourself and what beliefs are you having that are holding you back from creating that instant changer or that long term change what things are holding you back right now and how can you change your beliefs around them so that's what we're going to talk about right here. You're breaking down your current beliefs. Once you have kind of found a belief that you're thinking in your mind that's causing you either to procrastinate or to not live to your fullest, this is kind of what you can do in order to break that belief down. How is this belief ridiculous or observed? Was the person I learned this belief from worth modeling in this area? A lot of the times we get our beliefs from our parents and we might be trying to achieve something differently than our parents. Um, so it's very important to think about where you're getting your beliefs from and are you modeling it after someone that has, you know, excelled in a certain area that you are trying to excel in. Number three is what will ultimately cost me emotionally, if I don't let go of this belief. And again, with the failure, you are going to continually stay in the same spot until you die essentially. And you need to really bring it out and bring that emotional intensity owed as well. What will it ultimately cost me in my relationships if I don't let this belief go and obviously these are just questions that you can use on an as needed basis. What will it ultimately cost me physically if I don't let this belief go? What will it ultimately cost me financially if I don't let this belief go? And what will it cost my family and loved ones if I don't let this belief go? And really you want to write this out and you want to try and make this as big as possible in order to make a quick change once you found a belief that is not serving you in the way that you needed to serve you. So I kind of as a summary here for the change in an instant, we need to think about how to make change quickly. And why is it that most people think that change takes a so long one reason obviously is that most people have tried again and again through willpower, right through just trying to make a change at this decision level without even thinking about pain and pleasure without thinking about how your belief systems can change the way that you perceive pain and pleasure. Very interesting, right we're trying to make this change without having been taught how to actually make a change and that's why we're failing continually. And that's why we've kind of had created this belief system that it's not worth it to try and make a change. The assumption that they then make is that the important changes must take a long time. It'd be very difficult to make. In reality, it's only difficult because most of us don't know how to change. Boom. Again, we're same thing. We're taking a belief system, and changing it so much. We're changing this assumption, this, this generalization that something is going to take a long time. It'd be very difficult, right that's a lot of pain and not very much pleasure, but you can think, okay, I can make a massive change very quickly and take massive action towards it and it's going to make a change. If you can change that belief, um, then you'll be able to actually make that change and go faster and move towards pleasure instead of away from pain. So we don't have enough of an effective strategy. Willpower, willpower by itself is not enough. 
not if we want to achieve lasting change. And this is kind of the, the intermediary between these two areas where you can not only use this change in an instant for making this very fast change, which of course we all have certain things that we want to change quickly. We want to stop procrastinating and etc, but you can also use it for achieving lasting change. So here's some beliefs that you might have about change currently. First, we must, or things that you would want to change your belief into. Excuse me. First, we must believe something must change. Not that it should change, not that it could or ought to change, but that it absolutely must not, and you can see how much emotional intensity Tony is trying to convey in the book here. And I'm trying to convey it to you as well as there must be a lot of emotional intensity around all of these things because going back to pain and pleasure, it's very important that you can kind of conjure up these ideas and belief systems to create this big swing between pain and pleasure. Because that's where our motivation really comes from. Second, we must not only believe that things must change, but we must also believe that I must change it, that I have the responsibilities to change it, right we don't want to believe that we can wait for someone else to change for us. And third, we have to believe that I can change it without believing that it's possible for us to change. As we've already discussed in our last chapter, we stand no chance of carrying through on our desires dot and again, that's the pain and pleasure. If you don't believe that you can do it, you're going to think that you're constantly just hitting your head against the wall and it's not going to be pleasurable, obviously hitting your head against the wall continually. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, knack or neuro-associative conditioning. And these are just kind of a few things that you can ask yourself. I might not read all of them all at once here, but these are, this is a technique that Tony really talks about as far as change goes. Um, and how you can kind of condition yourself to change the beliefs. So decide what you really want and what's preventing you from having it. The more specific you can be, the better you have to know where you want to be in order to point yourself in the right direction. And we're going to talk a lot more about this at a little bit later. That's why I'm kind of running over this quickly. The entire book is really about neuroscience of conditioning. I just felt like this would be a good spot for us to do. A quick overview of it. The only way we'll make lasting change by creating a sense of urgency that we must change now, right that goes back to the change in an instant. If you can find a massive source of potential pain that's great from, from not changing, you need to create one. Sorry. If you can't create, find a massive source of potential pain from not changing, you need to create one. And that goes back to changing your belief systems, which we have seen. That is completely possible and not only possible if you learn how to do it, you can dot you can continually get yourself to make these massive change very, very quickly and relatively easily because you're pulling a lever that most people don't even know is there. So if you tried many times to make a change but have failed in doing so, that just means that your level of pursue perceived pain from not changing is not high enough. Write that down. Really visualize the pain that you could potentially get by procrastinating on this specific thing. Use pain and do some questions like, what will it cost me if I don't change to highlight the consequences and use pleasure associating questions like what will I gain if I make this change to further motivate yourself to make it and interrupt the limiting pattern. So if you're constantly thinking the same belief pattern, you've got to interrupt that you've got to make a massive, ah, perceived change in your pain and pleasure kind of matrix that we've talked about. You need to make a massive change in that quickly. So we can be highly motivated to change. But if we keep doing the same things and running the same patterns, then nothing will happen. We'll just get more of the same pain and frustration. That's how powerful, um, pain and pleasure really is, is that you can't get to, you can get to decisions with willpower, but to really make a lasting change and to make it a real massive change is all about being able to control your pain and pleasure. And it's great for us because now that we know about it, it's much easier to control your pain and pleasure than it is to control willpower. For sure. Willpower is a finite resource, 
but your ability to conjure up pain and pleasure in, in your mind is infinite. Our imagination is really infinite. It's a beautiful thing. So we have to constantly choose the new behaviors that are going to replace the old one. What eventually leads to relapse for smoking drugs is usually a large amount of stress, so a lot of pain. So you can see that again, condition the new pattern until it's consistent. Your brain cannot tell the difference between something you've imagined strongly and something that you've experienced, great as scheduled to reinforce and reward your behavior. How can you feel good each time you get it right? This is very interesting. Um, he's not only talking about changing their pain and pleasure, but then also associating pleasure in the moment of you actually completing it as well. So reinforcement needs to happen immediately after the behavior occurs. You could use something like A your favorite song and etc and then test it. If you're attempted and work to fix your behavior, then you need to go back to step one. Are you crystal clear on why you want this and how much better your life will be when you do it? So this is kind of neuro socio conditioning in a nutshell. But what I would say is that the rest of the book is really going to go over neuro associative conditioning and kind of, it really does start from, you have to think about your decisions and then we're going to talk about creating a compelling future at the end, which I really think could be the first step to the entire thing. It's almost in reverse order here. It's almost like a reverse pyramid that we're talking about these specific actions. So the next part we're going to talk about is long term change. The only way for us to have long term happiness is to live by our highest ideals, to consistently act in accordance with what we believe our life is truly about. Dot, and this is about our values. So it's very important that if you were, if you were in congruence with, you're not making the decisions that you want, it's because you're looking pain and pleasure to certain things because you probably believe certain things about certain situations because your values have told you what is valuable. So you, if you change your belief systems and your values, it then helps you change your painting, what you feel is painful and pleasurable, which then directs the decisions that you're making, which as we talked about before, everything that happens in your life is a result of the decisions that you're making. So really all of the things that we're talking about along the line here are going to be more powerful levers than willpower in order for you to change your decisions, especially in the long term. So we'll talk about resetting your values a little bit here. Step number one is you've got to find out what your current values are and rank them in order of importance. This will give you insight into what you want to experience most. You are moving towards values and what you want to avoid most in your life you're moving away from values. It will give you an understanding of why you do what you do. It will also offer you the opportunity if you'd like to consistently experience more pleasure in your life by understanding the pain pleasure system that's already built within you. So these are deep held values usually that come from potentially childhood. These are less belief systems. They're more. They're deeper than belief systems. For example, if you value hard work or for example, if you value relaxation, that's what you're going to kind of orient your life towards. Finding more relaxation or find you're finding more hard work. Whereas if you value flow or if you value time spent serving people, that's what you orient your life towards. So that's kind of um, a few examples of what values really are and they're really deep. So you have to think and spend a lot of time meditating, spent a lot of timing in quiet, thinking about what your values are. And every time a new one comes up, maybe potentially just jot it down and ah, uh, think your entire way around it. Understand why you have that value. Understand where may, maybe you picked it up. Understand is it serving me or is it not serving me so those are all very important things that you could do with values around values. Step number two is if you're willing to take the bull by the horns, you have an opportunity to read, redirect your destiny, ask yourself a new question. What do my values need to be in order to achieve the destiny I desire and deserve? So after you've already found what your current values are through probably quiet time and etc., then you think, okay, what do my values need to be in order to achieve the destiny I desire and deserve? So very important. 
Are your value systems in alignment with your potential destiny, with your goals, with the things that you desire in your life, brainstorm or do put them in order? See which values you might get rid of in which values you might add in order to create the quality of your life that you truly want. And once you've really looked at your values, once you've really written your values down, it ends up being easy to adopt these new values because it's incongruent. And what's happened right now is that you're kind of out of congruence. You have a goal, you have something that you desire, but your values aren't currently in king ruins with it. And once you find values that are incongruent, I have found that it's easy to adopt those values. So it's, it's a little bit less, um, intensive. Then the belief systems, the belief system seem to be way more conditioned, at least for me specifically. And values are, once you find ones that are congruent, those are just gonna stick with you. You can maybe write them down or you could, you could have them. Um, for, for me, for example, written on a whiteboard right along with the compelling future, but very, very important that I believe that the belief systems is the thing that we're going to have to constantly continue to battle with just because they're much easier to be conditioned. Then I believe that the values are values usually started at the very, very early age. Top the next thing we're talking about is rules. And as long as we structure our lives in a way where our happiness is not, is dependent upon something we cannot control, then we will experience pain. Most of us have created numerous ways to feel bad, but only a few ways to truly feel good. So we have potential rules about let's say for example, um, my rule is that I'm only happy when I'm under 10% body fat, let's say. And if you have that rule, you can't be happy until you're under 10% body fat, which you then have to create this massive pain and massive pleasure towards that. And you know, it might be a good rule to potentially have, if you can easily stay at that 10% body fat or if it really is important to you to be under 10% body fat. But if you just say, if I have vibrant energy, if I have a lot of, um, energy to be able to serve people that might be a more worthwhile goal for you or not goal a rule for you. Um, as long as I continued to eat in a way that keeps me energized to help people accomplish what they want to accomplish or accomplish, whatever my destiny is, that is what's important to me. And the rule of the 10% is often too limiting or often too potentially potentially too restrictive of your happiness. Very, very important to that. So it's all about changing the way that you're viewing the situation so you can be winning and feel like you're losing because the scorecard you're using is unfair. Exactly what I was saying. If you're 11% body fat, let's say, and you're um, running like crazy exercising all the time and eating, you know, chicken and broccoli all the time, ah, uh, and you're extremely healthy and you have a ton of great energy, but you're 1% body fat over what you feel like you should be for whatever reason. It is an unfair scorecard because you're doing all of the things that you could potentially do, right and you have a ton of energy and you're serving people at a really high level. Your scorecard is just unfair. It's, it's, you have to make sure that the scorecard is fair to yourself and all we have to do to make our lives work is set up a system of evaluating that includes rules that are achievable, that make it easy to feel good and hard to feel bad, that constantly pull us in the right direction where we want to go. For example, when I first started this YouTube channel, I found myself setting up a rule that I needed to get a certain amount of views or a certain amount of watch time in order to be happy. But really what I did was I set up a rule that was unattainable. A new YouTube channel is very, very difficult to grow. And I actually have very little to do with being able to get views and get watch time, but what I can control and things that I can constantly put into my specific realm of possibility. And the rule that I would like to follow is I would like to put it three videos a week that's within my, that's within my control. And it's something that is achievable. It's, it's not necessarily easy for me to do, but it's pushing my, um, pushing my boundaries enough that I have to, you know, get a new belief system, get new values and change. You know, that that rule is the right rule for me because it's also going to lead to those views and etc. But the rule can't be the outcome. 
The rule has to maybe be what I call the, the KPI, which is the key performance indicator, which would be putting out three videos a week. So here, here we're going to go about realigning your rules. First, you can write down the answers to the following question. What does it take for you to feel successful and this could be in any area as we'll see here in a second. What does it take for you to feel loved by your kids by your suppose, by your parents, and by whoever else is important to you what does it take for you to feel confident what does it take for you to feel you're excellent in any area of your life look at the rules and ask yourself if they're appropriate. Do they make it easy to feel bad are your, are your rule sets so impossibly high that you can't even potentially reach them I can't stress enough how this is actually ruining people's lives. This is actually ruining people's lives. And once I realized this, this was a big shift for me, that I need to reset my goals, to keep myself motivated, to push myself just a little bit, to get myself to move forward and really achieve what I want to achieve. But I can't possibly set myself goals that are completely impossible to set, right if necessary. Change the rules so that it's easy to feel good and hard to feel bad. So again, same thing. It's easy to feel good. It's, it's three videos a week for me, for example, in this, in this specific realm, obviously there's many different realms like we talked about here, but it's not a, I need to get a thousand views on every video. It's not, it's not something that's impossible for me to control, but it's something within my control. It's a slight push for me to be able to actually achieve what, it's not so hard that I won't be able to do it. And if you set them, he doesn't really talk about this too much. But I would say that if you set them too easy, then it doesn't necessarily set you up for success either dot because what will happen is you won't actually get pleasure from achieving it. If it's too easy for you to do, it's going to be, it doesn't take any mental energy from you. It's not going to feel like it was worthwhile to for you to accomplish it. So it's very, very important for you to set something that's just just past your level of competence, I would say. So references are all the experiences of your life. The next part we're going to talk about in this lasting change in this long term change is references. So references are all the experiences of your life that you've recorded within your nervous system. Everything you've ever seen, heard, touched, tasted, or smelled, stored away inside a giant filing cabinet of your brain. Some references are picked up consciously and others or unconsciously, some results from your experiences you've had yourself. Others consist of information you've heard from others, and all of your references like all human experience become somewhat distorted, deleted, or generalized as you record within your nervous system. So again, your references are kind of the connected to your belief system in that your belief systems are built upon your previous references. And as we talked about in the belief system, the references that you have are no longer reality. Not only were they not reality in the time that they potentially happened to you because your reality is slightly distorted based on your belief system, your values and your rules and etc. But the fact that they have been sitting for so long in your unconscious mind and they're constantly going through these filters of your belief system, values and rules, that means that they have just more so much that you really, really, really need to go back and think about them. And that's what we talk about in this rewriting your references. Take a moment now and write down five of the most powerful experiences that have shaped who you become as a person. Dot, and this is usually fairly easy because once you are just quiet for a little while, those really impactful, um, times in your life or moments in your life are gonna pop up. They're going to be easy to find. And once you have them, you can, you can write them down. Think about some new references that would be very valuable for you to pursue. What are some new experiences that you need a good question might be in order to really succeed at the highest level to achieve what I really want to achieve, what are some references that I potentially need and once you've brainstormed a list of great references to acquire, put a timeline, and date on each one. 
Decide when you're going to do everyone or what are you going to learn to speak Spanish or Greek or Japanese and what are you going to take a hot air balloon ride when are you going to go to local old folks home in SD Carroll so you can see that you can do all these things and you can get new references and give yourself new references and not talked about theory. And the mind map is that you can rewrite those old references as well. You can go back and you can think how was my belief system I'm actually changing my reality of that very powerful experience that I had. How are my values and my rules changing that experience that I had and then after you've done that, go out and seek some of these good ones. I mean, it's always good to be able to think of some cool things that will give you great life experience or give you great references or um, any of those things. So what are you going to do something unusual and new dot very interesting. A lot of us are stuck in our current, ah, uh, rules that are very rigid and we stick to the same things that we do all the time and our references then no longer change. And they continually are the same ones that we've had since potentially childhood. Now the second to last part in this long term change is identity. And this is, we're getting to the really high level of once you can make a big change on your identity. It really cascades all the way down into the decisions, which again, the decisions are what's going to control your destiny. So time and again, researchers have shown that students' capabilities are powerfully impacted by the identities they develop for themselves as a result of the teacher's belief in their level of intelligence. And I actually, this wasn't in the book, but I actually saw a study where the teachers would tell someone they're good at math or the teachers, you would tell someone that they're not good at math and based on, you know, whatever their PR prior experience was, they completely know if I either they were, if they are good at math, they were good at math, and if they weren't good at math, they weren't good at math. Very interesting because the teacher really instilled in that person's identity that they were either good or they weren't good at math and that created the rules that they have if they're good at, if they, if the teacher told them they were good at math, their rule would be, I'm going to continue to work until I get this problem right, because I'm good at this and their values are, I'm good at this math. So I'm going to consistently learn more and more about math. My belief system, is that I will always be able to find the right answer. And I have great pleasure towards getting a great um, score on my math quiz, let's say, because this teacher, I'm reinforcing this identity that the teacher has for me, that I'm good at math. And by then I mean, teach their decision ends up being, they're studying for their math test. So you can see how this identity level will really cascade all the way down. And the great part of the identity, is that as we develop new beliefs about who we are, our behavior will change to support that new identity. So again, you could see how that belief system is really kind of connected to identity, but identity is even a higher level. It's a, it, it's something that is gonna really be able to shape your belief system. It is kind of a, a feedback loop where belief system helps change identity, which values helps change identity, but identity also helps change belief system and values. It's kind of a, a, a s it's almost like a circle, much more than it is, um, potentially, ah, uh, a pyramid or a ladder. But I really do think that changing the identity and changing this compelling future, these are the main cornerstones. If you can work on this, the belief system, ah, uh, understanding the pain and pleasure principle, all of it kind of ends up falling into place after that. So let's talk a little bit about changing or creating a new identity. Let your mind be curious, not fearful, not concerned, not looking for perfection or for anything in particular. Just ask yourself who am I and write down the answer and that. Ask it again. And each time you ask it, write down whatever surfaces and keep probing deeper and deeper. And this is kind of exactly what I was talking about. When you're looking for your values or the rules that you're having, when you're asking yourself this, what rules am I leading my life with? What values am I leading my life with? What belief systems do I currently have? You can do the same thing for identity dot, and a lot of this is so for flexible. And I think that's one main thing is a lot of people will probably just wash this mind map and they'll basically, um, they'll, they'll take their time learning how this all works, 
but they won't actually do the action. And you have to do the action, take time and do the action. So make a list of all the elements you want your new identity to have. And if you truly like to expand your identity in life, then right now consciously decide who you want to be. Get excited. Be like a kid again and describe in detail you who you've already, who you've decided you are today. And take a moment now to write down your expanded list. Very interesting. He talks about get excited and be like a kid. Don't let some of these belief systems, references and rules, um, block what you really want to become. Now. Develop a plan of action. You could take that now. Develop it. Plan of action that you could take that would cause you to know that you're truly living consistently with your new identity. So you can see we're starting with this identity. What references do I have to change? What rules do I have to change? What values? What belief systems do I have to change in order to have this new identity of who I want to become? The final step is to commit to your new identity by broadcasting it to everyone around you. The most important broadcast, however, is to yourself. So again, if you believe that you can make this change, you need to consistently reinforce that you are going to become this person that you wish to become. When you ask yourself who am I just ask yourself, who am I the most important or sorry, use your new label to describe yourself every single day and it will become conditioned within you. So this is kind of repetition, and continually doing this. And I don't think this is an exercise that you just need to do one time. I think this is something that you could do daily, a small version of it daily. This is something that you could do weekly. This is something that you could do monthly and certainly you should do it yearly as a kind of a one big deep dive into your identity and who you have become versus who you wish to become and that's what we're going to talk about here in compelling a future because most people's goals for you know who they are and what they want to accomplish are to pay the lassie bills to get by to survive, to make it through the day. In short, they're caught up in the trap of making a living rather than designing a life and that's what we're really doing with this identity part of it. It's not just about setting goals that matters, but what the quality of your life that you experience along the way. The direction we're heading is more important than the individual results and I really think that this one thing is something that's missing from a lot of the goal setting literature out there is that setting the goal is just so that you can set something that is pushing you just far enough for you to really become who you want to become. Because to me that's more important than any of the goals that you are potentially setting is who you become along the way. But here we go. We're going to talk a little bit about goals specifically. I would just implore you to keep that in mind, that the goals are not the goals. The goal is to become the person who can achieve the goals that you're setting for yourself. So write down everything you'd like to improve in your life that's related to your personal growth. Brainstorm for at least 5 minutes and don't stop writing. Again, we're coming back to being a kid. The same way that we're doing with this identity. Don't put anything off the table. So this includes things that you'd like to master, ah, uh, traits you'd like to develop, physical improvements, conquer fears. So you can see that the, this compelling future part of it is really going to dictate your identity. So you can see, if we start with this one, all of this stuff that we're doing is going to be able to fall into place a little bit better as we go along the way. Dot, but it's important to see where you're going to end up. Before I show you how to start, I think because this is really going to motivate you towards getting started here with this creating of a compelling future at a timeline to each of your goals, how long you want to give yourself any years to accomplish it. Choose your most important single one-year goal from this list and change your identity around what references do you need, what rules do you need to create, what values do you need to have in order to be able to accomplish it, what belief system do you need to change, how can you associate pain and pleasure with the correct behaviors towards that goal and then what decisions do you need to be making in order to achieve it, do you see how that all works and you can do all the same things exactly for your career, your toys, your business. I'll just expand these out here for a little bit for you guys, but if he wants to grab this whole entire mind map, which I really recommend you do, you can grab it. You can change it.